All right, good morning again, everybody. Welcome to the conclusion uh, of our unit on magnetism. We're gonna talk a little bit here about the uh, wondrous magic of induction. And then starting in the next lecture, we're gonna turn our attention over to optics. We're gonna sit there for uh, quite some time uh, learning about geometric and wave optics. We'll finish off the course with a little bit of nuclear physics, and then that will be it. So our big thrust for today is we've talked about the nature of the magnetic force that acts on a charge. We have talked about that um, magnetic forces can act on lots of charges or current, and that current produces magnetic fields that can then act on other uh, forms of current. What will motivate today, again, this beautiful magic of induction is if I have an object, and very specifically a closed conducting object, that is experiencing some magnetic field, that is passing through it, and I cause that magnetic field to change, or I cause the shape to change, or I cause the perception of the magnetic field within the shape to change, then I can cause a current to flow around that object. We're going to refer to this as the induced current that is produced due to a change in magnetic flux as it passes through some object. And we'll talk about um, sort of boning up all those terms in our lecture here today. That's the big concept we'll talk about today. So as usual, I'd like to do a little bit of a review uh, of the module that we just finished. This is our magnetic fields produced by current lines. We're gonna jump into, again, this notion of um, induced magnetic fields and induced currents, which are caused by changing magnetic flux within a system. And this will produce for us then what are called Faraday's law and Lenz's law, and they're really, uh, kind of two laws that describe the same equation, which is kind of funny, whereas one of the laws is dealing with the uh, sort of mathematical formalism that occurs within it, and the other one is dealing with the minus sign that comes out front, which is kind of fun. So uh, really more, uh, Faraday's law is going to give us the magnitude of the EMF that is produced by induction. Lenz's law is going to give us the direction of that induced current as it flows around the object. And again, we'll discuss uh, more of these much more in detail as we go through the lecture today. So let's start with this idea here. Again, let's do a little bit of a review of the studio that we just finished. At the very end of that studio, you had to tackle this really cool problem on power lines. And basically, do you need to be worried about the magnetic fields that are being produced by power lines if you live directly below one, if you're standing directly below one? You know, essentially, how does this um, how do these magnetic fields compare to the magnetic fields that are being produced by the Earth? So let's start with this question here. Let's focus on the left wire, which has current coming out of the page. Remember, circle with a dot is coming out of the page towards you. So if the current is coming out of the page, what is the direction of the magnetic field due to the left wire at the point down here, at point P? As usual, if you haven't yet, please pull up the grade scope assignment for this particular lecture. Think on this question, pause this video, Give us an answer in grade scope and return to the video when you're ready. So here you need to remember that around these current wires, the magnetic field is a circle. So I'm going to draw in a circle here. I'll do this for you. And here it is. So here's the circular magnetic field that is passing uh, or circulating around this particular current wire. I'm looking for the magnetic field at this point. I point my thumb in the direction of the current, which in this case is out of the page. My fingers wrap around that current wire in the direction of the magnetic field. You're going to have to do this yourself because it's perspective inverted from my camera. This is going to be um, counterclockwise circulating current. So I follow the circle around. Counterclockwise, I hit point P, and I get that it is pointing in a sort of up and rightward direction, which is most closely associated uh, to point C. If you like, you can also think about it like the direction of the magnetic field, because it is a perfect circle around one of these wires, is always going to be perpendicular than the radius vector, which is pointing towards the current wire. So in this case, um, here is the radius that points um, from the current wire towards the point at which I'm looking, and the magnetic field is always going to be perpendicular to that, which again is uh, point C. All right, focusing still just here on the left wire, which of these would correctly give the magnitude equation? Given that again, this magnetic field is being produced um, by a uniform straight wire. Pause the video, give us an answer in grade scope, and return to the video when you're ready. All 
All right, so here I'm just looking for magnitude of the magnetic field. You remember from a straight current wire that this is mu naught i over 2 pi r. But here you have to be careful with the r because I have a 20 meter vertical distance and a one meter horizontal distance. So I'm really looking for the r is gonna be the distance again from the current wire to the point at which I'm measuring the magnetic field and is gonna be this hypotenuse distance here, I need to use the Pythagorean theorem, the square root of the sum of the squares to find the hypotenuse of the triangle, and here I have it. All right, notice I'm being very careful about my SI units. If I want my magnetic field to be measured in Tesla, the current is going to be given uh, in amps, and the distance is going to be measured in meters. Now, you found in the studio that between these two wires, the X components canceled, but the Y components added together. So if that's the case, we had to calculate the y components for these two wires. What does the y component do to the left wire at that point? Pause the video, answer in grade scope, and resume when you're ready. Get some coffee. Okay, so looking here for the y component, let me annotate here. So I'm looking for this component of the magnetic field. To do so, I will need to know this angle with respect to the horizontal. But remember, the angle with respect to the horizontal is the same as this angle with respect to the vertical. So I can find this angle here by doing the tangent inverse of one meter over 20 meters, and then claim it's, this, it's gonna be the same as this angle here. I need the y component of this magnetic field. It is the side of the uh, triangle that does not touch the angle, so therefore it is the sine projection. Tangent inverse of one meter over 20 meters is about three degrees, so I'm gonna find that the y component is going to be, once I clear my annotations, uh, 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 the sine of three degrees. Remember, the y component picks up the component that does not uh, touch the angle, the side of the triangle that does not touch the angle is picked out by the sine function. And again, the angle given by the tangent inverse of 1 over 20, which is approximately 3. So in the final answer, because the right wire has the same exact y component, it's the same current, um, it is the same distance, and it's the same angle, uh, will be exactly the same component as this one. So the final answer is then just this answer multiplied by 2 to account for both of those all right, so here we are. Here we are at this um, magical moment where we need to understand the behavior of induction. I say this is magic because this is so strange, this particular effect uh, that is occurring. Now, I want you to understand the weirdness that is happening here. Previously, how did we understand the nature of um, current that is passing through a system? What did I need for that current to be able to move around a circuit. To push that current around a circuit, I needed some sort of source. Uh, and this is how I refer to it, is you needed a source of push. You needed a battery or you needed a power supply to provide the electric potential difference, to supply the push, to be able to get these charges to move around the circuit. But watch what's happening in this case. I can get current to move without supplying an explicit push without supplying some sort of a explicit battery or a power supply. And watch how I can do that. So here we're focusing on this bottom circuit that is hooked up to this ammeter that is measuring uh, whether or not current uh, is passing through. So I have this ammeter here and this ammeter is measuring some current. If I have another switch, I have another circuit close by where I continually open and close the switch. So I continuously am changing the current within this first circuit, and I hence am continually changing the magnetic field within this first circuit as well. Notice that's the kind of the same thing that I'm doing with this second circuit. I can force the second circuit, the one that is receiving the, as we'll come to call it, induced current. I can force this induced current to flow by having a magnet that I simply move up and down within the circuit. I can do the same thing here. So here I'm keeping the circuit and these wires stationary, but I am moving the magnet. Works the other way as well, where I can have the magnet stationary and I can take the circuit and I can move it in and out of the magnet. I'm still getting current to flow in this case. And again, I want to impress upon you the strangeness of this 
all right? The fact that I can get current to move around a circuit without having an explicit source of push, without having a battery present in these circuits, without having a power supply that is present in these circuits. It looks like this changing magnetic field has something to do with now supplying, if you like, an artificial push, which is getting this current to flow, that is inducing this current to take place without having an explicit presence of a battery or a power supply. And again, to understand this, we need to develop a new uh, concept, which is this of magnetic flux. And here it is, all right? Magnetic flux, all this is going to do for us is we're going to have some closed conducting object. In this particular case, I have a closed loop. This loop is gonna have some magnetic field that is piercing it, that is passing through it, all right? As I've indicated here. Magnetic flux is literally just a count of how much of the effective magnetic field, how many of these magnetic field lines, if you will, are piercing through this particular object, all right? By strict mathematical definition, magnetic flux is the dot product between the area vector of the shape and the magnetic field. Remember from uh, last semester, our discussion of work, others times that you've seen dot products, that the dot product is a scalar value that simply takes on the magnitude of the two vectors times the cosine of the angle between them. So here the angle is the angle between the area vector and the magnetic field. Note when the angle is zero, the area vector and the magnetic field vector are aligned, and I have the largest number of field lines that are piercing my shape. Note if the angle is 90, that the magnetic field is pointing this way, but your area vector is pointing this way, all right, which means your shape is sort of oriented this way. You would never have any field lines that pierce your shape. In that case, so in that configuration, your magnetic flux would be zero. So when I'm talking about magnetic flux, the size of the shape matters. The bigger the shape is, the more magnetic field lines it can catch, the more magnetic flux it has. The magnetic field matters because the bigger the magnetic field is, the more dense of the field lines that you get and the more magnetic field lines again are caught or captured or pierced through that particular object. But the angle also matters as well. Let me show you why. All right, in this case, I have the same area shape and I have the same magnetic field. All right, so the magnitude of the area vector is the same, the magnitude of the magnetic field vector as well is the same. But here, we're showing you that angle matters as well. This is why that cosine theta uh, very much matters when you're calculating your magnetic flux. In the first case, I am catching all of the magnetic field lines. But in the second case, I'm catching all of them except for a few on the very edge. So even though between both these cases, the area vector is the same, and the magnetic field is the same because the area angle is different because the shape is oriented different with respect to the magnetic field. The magnetic flux through case A is going to be larger than the magnetic flux through case B. And again, this is not strictly technically correct, but if it helps, you can think about it like magnetic flux is just a count of field lines. The more field lines that I have piercing through a surface, as I, as I um, have indicated for you here in this particular slide, the larger the magnetic flux is through that surface at some given time. All right, so we now have all the pieces in play and we can introduce this strange concept of induction. We're gonna introduce you, to you here a new idea, which is the EMF. EMF stands for electromotive force, and you can think of it like it is just a potential difference. Anytime you see the words EMF, you can replace those with electric potential difference, like the, like a, or a voltage, and you'll get to exactly the same place. All right, so this is what Faraday's law says. An EMF, or a voltage, or a potential difference, is created within one of these loops, one of these closed conducting loops, if, the magnetic flux through that loop changes. This is a really important point, all right? Because you can have magnetic flux present. I can have a number of magnetic field lines that are piercing through some given shape, and that's perfectly fine. But if that magnetic flux is not changing, if it is not increasing 
or decreasing, I will not cause this induction to occur. This beautiful effect of induction only takes place if the magnetic flux is changing. Now, remember from before, how did we define magnetic flux? And again, you don't need to um, understand the totality of, the, of this expression. Again, um, uh, derivatives and integrals are not a required piece of this course. We will never ask you to calculate a derivative or an integral uh, on an exam. But what you need to remember is that even that we show you here, uh, these in the forms of derivatives, derivative means change. So anytime you see the words derivative or see this d by dt that appears anywhere, just think of it like it means change. So changing the magnetic flux means I could cause this change to occur in one, or th one of three different ways. I can change the area of the loop. I can make the loop bigger or smaller. That will change the effective magnetic flux that the loop experiences, and you will get a voltage, an EMF, a potential difference that is created within that loop. I can change the area. I can change the magnetic field. I can turn the magnetic field on or off. I can um, grow the strength of the magnetic field, or I can weaken it. All of these will change the magnetic flux and will also then hence change, um, will cause a EMF to occur. I can also, because remember, um, magnetic flux is built from three things. So I can change the area, I can change the magnetic field, I can also change the angle of the object with respect to the field. Usually this takes the place of uh, the rotation of an object. This is the example that we gave here. If I rotated the object from case A to case B, I would be changing the magnetic flux that is piercing through it. Therefore, I would be inducing an EMF. I would be creating a potential difference that would cause a current to flow. So this is what Faraday's law says. Faraday's law says, I create an EMF by changing the magnetic flux. Then I can change the magnetic flux by changing one of these three, excuse me, one of these three different things. Usually, it's just gonna be one of the three, uh, that is changing. It's very rare that we'll throw at you a problem where more than one is changing because then it depends on how the one thing is changing with respect to the other thing and it gets kind of complex. So do not worry uh, too much about that. Now, I emphasize again for you here, we're talking about these EMFs that are being induced within these loops. And again, I want to reinforce to you that an EMF is simply a voltage. It is simply an electric potential difference. Since it behaves the same and is essentially just a voltage, everything that we learned about voltages in the course up to this point apply. This includes what I give you on this slide here, which is Ohm's law. If I am creating an EMF within a conducting loop such that current can flow, and this loop is providing some resistance, so we're not getting, you know, infinitely amounts of uh, current to flow, then the current is described by Ohm's law. Faraday's law and the change in the magnetic flux gives me the strength of the EMF or the strength of the voltage that is being produced. Ohm's law says take that voltage divided by the resistance and that tells you how much current is flowing. Since these EMFs again are essentially voltages, they will also satisfy Ohm's law. All right. Now again, this is about half the story, which is the um, how big is this induced current? that is being created by this change in magnetic flux. That's this, that was Faraday's law. The other piece is what is the direction of that induced current that is gonna flow around that object? That is Lenz's law. And here it is simply stated, the current will flow to oppose the change in magnetic flux. And the way I want you to think about this is nature, and again, when I, when I say the word nature here, I'm referring to um, all of the inherent uh, mathematical laws and representations that underpin um, the evolution and behavior of the reality that we understand it. So nature likes to keep things the same. If an object is in some particular equilibrium, in some particular energy state, usually, typically speaking, nature will evolve such that it tries to retain that energy state as best as it possibly can. This is encapsulated in Lenz's law, where um, an object will have some magnetic flux that is passing through it. I get this induction to occur by causing that magnetic flux to change, but nature does not like that magnetic flux changing. Nature is going to try to keep the original magnetic flux that you had 
and will cause current to flow around the object to try to retain the original magnetic flux that was inherent in the system. That's a lot of words, I recognize that. So let me show you what I mean. Let's go through an explicit example. Let's go back to our loop here that has some magnetic field piercing through it, uh, and let's say in this case in a vertical direction. Now I'm gonna cause my magnetic flux to change by turning down uh, the magnetic field. So I'm gonna slowly be turning it off uh, as time goes on. All right, let's use Lenz's law to say what is the direction of the induced current as it flows around this ring. All right, and here's what you wanna think of. The magnetic flux in this ring is changing, therefore an induced current is going to result. Remember from our previous lecture, induced currents create magnetic fields, or all currents really create magnetic fields, so this induced current is going to create a second magnetic field that we will often refer to as the induced magnetic field. So there are really two magnetic fields here in play. The original field, which we give you here in this system, this is the one that is weakening and that is causing the change in the magnetic flux. This will cause the induced current, which will then cause a new magnetic field, a second magnetic field, that we will call the induced magnetic field. Lenz's law will then be the interplay between the second magnetic field and the first one. Let's see how, that, let's see how this works. Excuse me. Answer these questions for me. Let's play along. Let's go through this here. Um, if I'm turning down the magnetic field, as I'm doing here, what is happening to the magnetic flux through the loop? Well, the area is staying the same, and I'm turning down the field, therefore the magnitude of the magnetic field is getting weaker, therefore my magnetic flux is getting smaller. All right? Now, nature does not like this. Nature tries to oppose this decrease and tries to get the flux back to the way it was before. So if nature needs to get the flux back to the way it was before, is the induced, is the second magnetic field going to try to support the original weakening field, or is it going to fight back against a strengthening magnetic field? Well, in this case, I am turning the magnetic field down. So my induced magnetic field is gonna to act to try to support the original one, to try to add more field to it to get back to the original magnetic flux that you had. So my induced magnetic field is going to try to support the original field and is going to point in the same direction. In this case, it will point upwards. Now we get to use our right-hand rule. All right, everybody do this with me. If your thumb points upwards, if the magnetic field is pointing upwards, the induced magnetic field due to this Lenz's law effect, what will be the direction of the induced current around that loop? Well, everybody do this with me. You should notice if you point your thumb upwards, your fingers are spinning around your hand to form a thumb in a counterclockwise direction. So I would say here that the induced current is going to flow in a counterclockwise direction due to this change in this magnetic flux. Do you understand what, what happened there? Do you see the steps that we're going through? Because it's essentially the same steps for every single Lenz's Law problem you're going to solve. What is happening to the magnetic flux? Is it getting stronger or weaker? Is nature going to support a weakening flux or fight back against a strengthening flux? This will then provide the direction of the induced magnetic field. Your fingers then provide the, the direction of the induced current. All right, let's practice using Lenz's Law. Here's our first question. I'm taking the loop, I am shrinking it. What will be the direction of the induced current? Please pause the video, think on this question a little bit, give us your answer in grade scope, return to the video when you're ready. Okay, let's go through our steps for understanding the direction of induced current. The loop is shrinking. Therefore, the magnetic flux that is passing through it is weakening. Nature needs to support the weakening flux. So nature is gonna produce the induced magnetic field that points in the same direction as the original one, to try to beef up the flux and get it back to its original amount. Everybody do this with me. If you point your thumb into the page, for the induced magnetic field, your fingers spin around your thumb to form a fist. 
in the direction of the magnetic of the induced current and you'll find that your fingers will spin around in a clockwise direction you following these steps here all right the loop is shrinking so the flux is getting smaller nature needs to support the weakening flux to get back to the original amount so it produces its own secondary into the page field this induced magnetic field by the right hand rule will produce an induced clockwise current within that object all right let's try another one just got lots of these we'll just practice this a couple of times this time i'm taking the loop and i'm rotating it and i'm rotating it um, in the plane of the page pause the video think on this question answer to grade scope and resume the video when you're ready All right, so here we have to ask, what is the nature of the changing magnetic flux? And let's go through our three pieces. Is the area of the loop changing? No. Is the strength of the magnetic field changing? No. Is the angle of the loop relative to the field changing such that the loops, field lines that pierce through it are changing? No. So since none of my three that produce flux are changing, by rotating this object, I am not changing the magnetic flux that is passing through it. Therefore, there is no induced current. Now, I want to make this point very clear to you, all right? There is magnetic flux that is piercing through this loop, but because in the simple act of rotating the loop, I am not changing the nature of that flux, I will not produce any induced current or any induced magnetic fields. You must change the flux to produce induction. This is an example where there is flux, there is magnetic flux, but it is not changing. Therefore, induction is not going to appear for this question. All right, here's another one for you. Notice I have two loops here, an outer loop and an inner loop. I want you to determine the direction of the induced current in the inner loop. Pause the video, answer on grade scope, and return when you're ready. All right, let's go through our steps once before. I'm focusing here on the inner loop. What is happening to the change in the flux of the inner loop? Well, let's see what's happening to the circuit. I close the switch. It's going to cause current to flow, and it means that current is going to flow through this outer loop in a clockwise direction. Okay, I use my right hand rule, so everybody has to use their right hand. If current flows around an object in a clockwise direction, what is the direction of the magnetic field that results, the direction of your thumb? Well, I get that the direction of my thumb, everybody do this with me, is going to point in to the page. So this inner loop here is experiencing all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a magnetic field that is pointing into the page. Now, what was the original flux? of this magnetic uh, 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 with that is passing through uh, this inner circle. The original flux that was passing through that circle is zero. So nature tries to retain zero and it's seeing a ton of magnetic field now that is pointing into the page. So to return to zero, nature is gonna fight back with a magnetic field, an induced field, the secondary magnetic field that points out of the page. Everybody do this with me. If the magnetic field points out of the page, what, what direction do your uh, fingers spin around your thumb for the current? You would find that they spin around in a clockwise direction, excuse me, counterclockwise direction. So the induced current here will be counterclockwise. Again, you see the stepwise process here? This was designed such that the initial flux that is passing through that blue loop is zero. So nature is gonna to try to retain zero as best it can. If it sees a huge influx now of magnetic field pointing into the page, it's going to fight back by producing an induced field that points out of the page. All right, lots of practice on these. Here's another one for you. Read through it, think about this to yourself, answer in great scope, and return to this question and the video when you're ready. All right, so I have a metal bar here that is moving to the left, and it is creating then um, an area that is this shape here. It's kind of this rectangular shape. So let's go through our standard process. Um, is the magnetic flux changing? Yes, it is, because as the bar slides to the left, the rectangular area 
that is made, that is allowing current to flow, is becoming bigger. So my flux is increasing. Nature wants to fight back and try to decrease that flux back to the original amount. So in this system, as the bar slides, I am getting more magnetic field into the page. Nature fights back by producing an induced field out of the page. Once again, wrap your fingers around. If the induced field points out of the page, your fingers wrap around in a counterclockwise direction. And again, this is the reason why. The flux is increasing. Nature fights back with a counteracting magnetic field, which would be an out of the page field, and that produces counterclockwise current to flow, again, by the right hand rule. All right, another one for you. Pause the video, think on this one, answer in grade scope, resume the video when you're ready. All right, so once again, let's just test our big three. As the loop moves through the field but remains within it, does the area of the loop change? No. Does the magnetic field that the loop perceives change? No, because it is still staying within the field. It is not, let, is not yet left the field. Is the angle between the shape and the magnetic field changing? No. So since none of the big three are changing that cause magnetic flux, there will be no induced current. Once again, I want to point this out, that this loop is indeed experiencing a magnetic flux. But because the magnetic flux of that loop is not changing, there will not be an induced current. Induction only occurs when there is change in the magnetic flux in a system. This is another beautiful example of there being magnetic flux there, but because the flux is not changing, there will not be induction. All right, so all of that was under the context of uh, Lenz's law type problems. Uh, what's the direction of the induced current? Let's practice now using the explicit form of Faraday's law. So here I have a loop with some resistance. I'm going to place it in a magnetic field and I'm going to turn up the field pretty quickly, uh, half a Tesla in a few milliseconds. All right, let's use Faraday's law to say what is the induced current within the loop. So as we know, remember, Faraday's law is this big long statement where um, I can cause an induced current by changing any one of these three things. I can change the area, I can change the magnetic field, or I can change the angle between the area and the magnetic field. Which of these here do we get to ignore? In a sense, which of these um, are not changing? Pause the video, answer on grade scope, return when you're ready. So here we just need to look into the context of the question. The only thing that is changing here is the magnetic field. I'm turning the magnetic field on in some given time. So I'm not changing my area and I am not changing my angle. So the answer here is more than the above because I'm not changing the angle, d a dt is zero, excuse me, uh, d cos theta by dt is zero, and I'm not changing the size of the loop, its area. So the d a dt is also zero. So the only term I have to worry about is the area times the cosine of the angle times how quickly the magnetic field is changing in how quickly the time is changing. All right, now be careful here. When you go through these calculations, you must have SI units. What would be the SI area of the loop? Do this calculation, pause the video, answer in grade scope, return here when you're ready. So remember, of course, this is a circular loop. Uh, we're going to do its area as pi r squared. So you're going to have to convert the circumference into a radius. Remember, circumference is 2 pi r. And then convert that radius from centimeters to meters before doing your pi r squared. When you do, uh, I find that the answer is this top one here. So convert circumference to radius, and don't make the common mistake of when you do your pi r squared, you need to have your radius in meters before you do so. And that's my solution here. So let's finish off the question here. Uh, what is the current? So remember, the current by Ohm's law is the EMF or the voltage divided by the resistance. We determine that there is only one term that we have to retain since the area does not change and the angle doesn't change. So let's just plug things in. Here's the area, pi r squared, I figured that out earlier. Uh, the magnetic field is parallel to the area of the loop, which means the angle between the area vector of the loop and the magnetic field is zero. 
cosine of zero is one. So I put this in here. Remember, don't get um, uh, uh, annoyed by the fact that the derivatives are here. Anytime you see derivative, just replace it with change. So this essentially is the change in the magnetic field over the change in time. Well, the change in the field was 0.55 Tesla. The change in the time was 15 milliseconds. And again, I'm careful to convert to my SI unit and make it a second. So 15 times 10 to the minus three. Here's the resistance of the loop, again, which obeys Ohm's law. And uh, we picked all these numbers uh, specifically so that the current works out to a really nice value, which in this case is one amp. All right. That is all I have for you today. I hope the lecture helped uh, sort of unravel some of the mysteries of this induced magnetic field and these induced currents that can occur in studio either later today or whatever later this week, whatever you're viewing this video. You'll solve some more questions on induced current. You'll look a little bit more of uh, the mathematical form of this Faraday's law. And then that is it. Uh, in the next lecture, we're going to start turning our attention to uh, the behavior of electromagnetic waves, which are the behavior of light waves. We're going to immerse ourselves in the language of optics for a little bit, both geometric optics and wave optics. So I hope you enjoy those lectures. Uh, one of my favorite units is um, our unit on vision. So we'll talk about how contact lenses correct your vision. So I hope you enjoy that when we get there for now. Uh, thank you for your attention as we went through these modules on magnetism. I hope this uh, helps make these ideas a little bit more clear. And again, thank you for listening. Hope you have a nice day.